Thanks, Gary, and thanks for everyone still being here at this stage, particularly those who have been to both conferences. It's been a pretty long, heavy load and listening to lots about data and analysis and things like that. And um, like Gary, I've been to a lot of these, not as many as Gary, but I think I've been to nine or ten and I've missed a couple through family matters and illness and things that I've actually helped organise. So it's been a bit, bit of a strange experience. Um, this is the only Australian presentation, uh, which is a bit of a shock to me, a um, bit disappointing in some ways, but it's been fabulous to see all the other presentations and how far people have come. And um, we see the contrast with the, the UK that are really good with managing data and big planning and policy, and we've seen the Americans uh, incredibly creative trying to deal with a really com complex um, environment. And, uh, you know, that's the two contrasts to me, that it's really full of difficulties but full of achievement as well on both sides. And, you know, I really connected with a lot of the stuff that Northwest Ambulance just talked about and some of the issues, and we'll probably touch on some of them. Um, I particularly like the things on the, the native reservations in the US because we have a problem in the Australia and we haven't done much about it. So we could actually learn quite a lot, and we have Aboriginal health services that are pretty independent, so there's a lot of potential to do things. Um, we've been on an interesting journey in Australia because a lot of the community paramedic initiatives started in Australia years ago, and like the English services, the ambulance services in, on the whole have concentrated on cardiac arrest, trauma and stroke, and everything else, the ball essentially just disappeared. And we're very good at all those acute things. You know, we get very good results by world standards. But we've let all this other community stuff, the other 70% of patients, sort of disappear. So this project that I'm going to talk about is about two small towns. It's one project. But it's actually a continuation of a project that started 15 years ago that I was involved in designing. And then the ball was dropped. Well, they picked up the ball now. And we're back to where we should have been about 12 years ago. And they're implementing it. Now, Sue Walsh was going to come and present and do most of the presenting, actually, because she is actually the community paramedic in these small towns. And you would have got a lot out of it. She would have got a lot out of being here. But unfortunately, she couldn't get away. So sorry about that. You're stuck with me who hasn't got the hands-on side of it. But I'm really excited by the project. And um, you'll understand why as we go along. So firstly, what I'm going to do is talk about the context, Ambulance Victoria, the local setting, how things look locally, the program itself, describe the initiatives, because it is new and they're starting, and a little way to go, and then some of the future plans, some future hopes, really, and uh, give you a chance to ask some questions. Now, I don't intend to speak for an hour. I'm happy to accelerate the program a little bit, so don't sort of feel like you have to sit and listen to this for an hour. Uh, that's a modern ambulance on the screen. <laughs> They're improving, Dad. Now, this is all set in Ambulance Victoria. Now, Ambulance Victoria is a very large ambulance service, a bit like the UK ambulance services. 3,500 staff, 150 odd ambulances, uh, 850, 150 stations. Um, there's a mixture of full-time staff who are essentially ACPs, and then there's about a 1,000 volunteers and first responders who directly report to the ambulance service. And um, they're going to extend this program, as I said. And it's actually a three-year program to move beyond this community into another 12 communities. So it's a big project, really, over a, a pretty big area by UK standards. So these are the two little towns. One's Wedderburn. Um, Wedderburn's got a population of nearly 700 people and small indigenous population. People aren't very well off, mainly farmers, all the services that look after farmers. Uh, they have a single GP who's there during the week, nothing at night, nothing on weekends, uh, no, no hospital, no allied health, no after hours, not much at all. The only service they've had up until now have been community first responders who actually come under the ambulance service. And this project is actually upgrading the, the first responders into what 
broadly is termed a PCP paramedic who's a certificate trained paramedic, not a university trained one. These are retained volunteers, which means that they get paid to do a little bit of training each month or every couple of weeks, and they get paid when they go out and do a call. Now that's probably not dissimilar to some other parts of the world. So they're, they're not professional paramedics in these towns. That's what's been there originally. Now at Bort, they've also had community first responders and they're doing the same thing, they're upgrading them. The town is a little bit different. They're quite close together and the next slide will show you why. Um, similar sort of population, but they have doctors and they have a hospital. They're a little bit further away from the major base hospital, which is Bendigo, which is where I live. Bendigo's got a quite a large population, of about 100,000 for a rural area, and a very big new hospital that only opened last week with, I don't know how many beds, 650 beds or something. It's a big hospital and um, very modern and got everything there, but these towns haven't got very much at all. So Wedderburn and Bort, very similar in terms of industry, population similar, and they've had very few services. Until the community first responders were put in, they didn't have anything. It was completely neglected. So what this project's doing, it's putting a community paramedic who's an ACP, um, who's Sue Walsh, over the top of them. So she becomes the leader of those two groups in those two towns. So she does the training, she does the staff selection, she manages them, she does clinical governance, she does go to some calls, she will liaise with doctors and hospitals and other health professionals and other parts of the community. So that's her job, is to look after those, those towns and those communities, not just the volunteers, but the whole community and liaise with people. And so she works within the ambulance service clinical governance system and what she can do is authorise the volunteers to do particular procedures and ext extend their scope of practice. And we'll get to that in a little while. This is one of the local residents. You can see it's a farming area. <laughs> He's got some mates in the background. If you, ha if you look closely, you'll see quite a lot of sanders there. And there was about another 10 in the paddock. This is actually at Wedderburn. I took this photograph um, just before Christmas. Surprise, surprise. This is probably more informative. This sort of locates them. You'll see one sign to Wedderburn and one to Bort. It's on the same road. And um, that's a pretty typical uh, farming ha house in the background. So it's sort of dry farming, um, not many people around at all. And Wedderburn and Bort are located where you can see most of those dots. It's just above them in those red areas uh, up towards the river. So the top part across there is the Murray River, which is the largest river in Australia. And the region that's highlighted is the northwest, or Bodden Mallee, it used to be northwest region when I worked there. Um, and to just give you an idea of scale, Victoria's got six million people, which is around about the same as Scotland, I think. And the area we have at land mass is the same as England, more or less. And we're the most populous and most closely um, settled state in the country. So we're not considered rural at all by the rest of Australia. But by, say, UK standards, it would be like having only seven million people in England. All right? So that, that's how it's sort of populated. And you can see, you probably can't read anything there, but the, the bigger dots are big ambulance stations with 24-hour shifts and so forth. And um, then they walk, the blue ones are professional stations, the red ones are, are volunteers and first responders. And uh, there's also a helicopter based in Bendigo. And that's all controlled by the one ambulance service. Uh, the communication centre's not even in this region. It's actually in the adjoining region in a place called Ballarat. So there's two comm centres for the state. And trying to get a community paramedic system to work in this environment is actually quite challenging. Because I was just saying over the lunch, the lunch to a few, few people is that big ambulance services are really good, but as someone pointed out, it's a bit like trying to direct a super tanker. You know, if you want to change direction with a large ambulance service, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of work and pushing and shoving. You can't just flip over and say, oh, we'll just do this program. But once they do commit to it, it's actually really good because they've got lots of resources. 
and lots of backup technically and so forth. So it's a different sort of challenge. So what they're doing, they've started in um, April this year. Is that, no, last year. April's last year, isn't it? And uh, they had a secondee put in to just start the program. And it wasn't Sue, it was a different person. Tim did that. And then Sue's been appointed since then, in October. And um, now they're implementing the bought part of the project. And um, she's basically going in and doing that um, community needs assessment. And a lot of that's just going and talking to people and doing the politics and going and talking to the GPs, talk to the hospital, talk to the schools, actually get the volunteers on side because not all volunteers like professional staff coming in over the top of them. Um, they like to be independent and, and uh, do their own thing, strangely enough. But it's been really positive from what Sue tells me that people have really welcomed her with open arms. And in fact, I just had a, a FaceTime with my partner in Bendigo and she was talking to a friend who lives in Wedderburn and uh, Sue, I didn't know this until half an hour ago, Sue um, actually went and saw his mother because she'd actually had um, a number of ambulance calls in the last month and they went out to check her out to go and see if they could stop her being a frequent caller. And uh, she's a little lady who's about 90 who um, lives on a big property in the middle of nowhere. So this is what they're doing. And I'm, well, um, the, the program itself is broken into a whole lot of parts, like all uh, community paramedic programs. And this one's fairly general. It's not directed at any particular type of patient yet. It could well be. But what we're saying is that it really is dependent on partnerships, and that came out yesterday a lot, that if you're going to do a community paramedic project, if you can't form and maintain partnerships, you may as well give the game away. It won't work. So there's some of the people who are partners, and you'll notice the university is a partner, and we'll come to that in a minute. And um, there's four parts of it. There's the integrated community initiatives, educational, operational, and clinical. So they're the four areas they're concentrating on at the moment. And this is very much at the start. So you can see the types of things they're doing. Don't worry about the names of the particular places. The Murray Health Pathways is like some of the things people have been talking about here, about pathways for helping patients get through our system. Uh, there's the stroke STEM piece, which is part of Ambulance Victoria's strategy and trying to integrate this into that acute side of it and um, getting the ambulance service more involved, doing some training and confidence building with the GPs and the health service, because GPs don't see a lot of emergencies, for instance, and aren't terribly um, confident about the whole thing. So trying to make that work and make them feel more confident. The La Trobe University stuff is where I am. We, just to diverge a bit, our university has a paramedic program. There's a four-year program, and it's a program of paramedic practice and public health. So the public health things that, like the social determinants of health that we've heard a lot about is in our course. And um, we do a whole lot of health promotion and uh, public health in general. And the students are going to be involved in this program. Um, they're doing some outreach for people, which has also been talked about here, and then doing some public relations. And these things are all interrelated. Um, you can't actually separate them out. Like for instance, the students are going to go in and do placements in this town. We only have 40 students in our course each year. And by the time they get to fourth year, when they do these placements, there's probably 35 left. And we think we can actually accommodate all the students to do placements in these two towns and do public health initiatives. Not clinical. If they happen to get a job, that's fine. But they'll just be going out and actually teaching people CPR and doing health checks and doing community needs analysis, things like that, going visiting people in their homes. So it'll be a real revelation for the students to do this. And they have to do the equivalent of a month's placement for this subject. So it's going to be interesting to see how it actually works. Some of the um, educational initi initiatives. Um, this is more to do with the volunteers than anyone else. What they've done is they've adapted um, some of the training and the clinical practice guidelines to make them a bit more um, understandable to volunteers who don't have a great deal of education. And um, 
so that they'll actually learn them and operate and be able to do more things. Uh, so they're doing a much more hands-on sort of program and not just standing up and doing lectures, much more practical. And um, they're, they're changing some of the content as well. In, in Victoria, they have a conference for volunteers each year. They spend about $20,000 a year on a conference for volunteers and they do continuing professional development. So they're gonna up the ante in that. The photos are actually our students at La Trobe. Now this feeds into the clinical initiatives, which is actually really quite interesting. The training traditionally for volunteers in these places has been about one, once a month. That's what it was 30 years ago when I was doing it. We'd go out to each station and we'd do a session one night, once a month. What they've done is they've upped the ante and they're doing it fortnightly because Sue's there in the community. So she can do much more of it. And yeah, they're focusing on the basic things and they're encouraging them to get better at doing the basics that they do well. They're doing competitions and all sorts of things. They turn the CPGs into scripts so it's easier to follow. They're trying to improve clinical documentation so that the PCRs get filled out properly and they get good data. And one of the outcomes, which is interesting, because I was involved in the original study, um, they're going to introduce intranasal fentanyl for volunteers to give. So they'll actually have methoxyfluorine and fentanyl to give for pain relief as volunteers. And what will happen is Sue in her role as the community paramedic, she will have carriage of that. She'll have clinical governance authority. She will decide who can give fentanyl and who can't, and she'll audit all the PCRs. So it's that clinical and community leadership that the community paramedic is giving. So it's a bit of a combined role. The other thing that's happened, not to forget all the operational things, which after the two days of the ELF conference, it's actually improved response times because they've got more volunteers, they're more available. Um, Sue's available sometimes. So they've actually improved that. Um, it's a pretty big improvement actually, I'd have to say. And um, they've improved the medication uh, documentation because through the training. So what they've done so far is it's been positive. That's just word of mouth. Um, what they, they say is that the volunteers in particular feel less isolated and much more supported. And they're starting to get to the point of taking some initiatives to do some preventative health care in the community. And, and that's really going to be the big piece in the future. Um, the training's been very positive and um, people have actually done the training. They've done some online training as well and people have been completing it. Because if you've got a person coming back every fortnight to check on you, saying how's it going, you're much more likely to do it. So there's been a lot of success in that area. So the future plans, well the future plans is to be rolled out on another 12 sites and 12 sites is not 12 towns, 12 sites is about 40 towns because they're clustered, they're clustered together and uh, they're reasonably um, isolated areas. These towns are about 70, 100 kilometres from a major centre, some are further away, some are a little bit closer. So that's going to be really exciting as they do that and that's what I wanted them to do 15 years ago. So you have to be very patient sometimes in this field. Um, education and training is actually a La Trobe initiative. We're um, in the process of getting approved a graduate certificate in extended community paramedicine and we're actually making it part of our undergraduate program. So they'll get an undergraduate degree plus a graduate certificate which can lead into a master's degree. Now that's not designed for the volunteers in the community. They operate at a different community paramedic level. We're talking about the people like the supervisor, the professional community paramedic. And yesterday when the career structure was done that Mary and her team had put together, it sort of fits into that fairly well because we've been pretty aware of that document as it's been going around. So we're doing a subject in extended care paramedicine, which we're already doing. That includes um, GP placements with the GP to see how GPs think. Um, they're learning about um, blood tests and other lab tests, what sort of things you can do there, um, how to refer people in all sorts of 
complicated areas that normally aren't within the scope of practice of paramedics, but they cut across other people. We're doing community paramedic piece that we haven't actually designed yet, but we're certainly going to include dental care, wound care, that sort of thing will be in it. We do major incident management and we're doing an advanced clinical unit in that four subjects for the graduate certificate. But all the social determinants of health and public health is already done in the degree, so we don't have to do that again. So what we're looking forward to is doing some research and evaluation and actually measure whether it's efficient, effective, safe and acceptable. Um, that's been a bit of a battle, I'd have to say. The ambulance service, like many of you, are really good at collecting data um, and they tend to work backwards. They say, what data have we got? What can we make of it? I'm actually quite critical of this and uh, Sue would be having a dig in the ribs with if she was here. I think the, the fatal flaw is that they're not asking the question first and then finding the data and the analysis approach. They're actually finding the data that they've got and saying, how can we actually get an answer? But they don't actually know the question. So we're actually trying to work, I've got a meeting with the ambulance service when I go back to try and have, get this message across. But they have to actually come up with a question before you actually start collecting all this data and doing stuff with it when you don't even know what you're looking for. But that's my problem to sort of deal with that. Um, so we'd like to, as I alluded to yesterday, we'd like to do some quality of life type research so that we can actually get some benchmarks on the communities and compare them to other communities without this sort of service and see if the implementation of a community paramedic program actually makes a difference to the whole population, not just the patients, but the population. Like the, the son of my, my girlfriend's mother, it's making a difference to his life that his mother is well looked after. It's nothing to do with him in a medical sense, but he will be actually having a better life because his mother's looked after. So it's a whole of community thing and that's a really big challenge and something that ambulance services aren't actually very good at. So we, we're trying to encourage them down that track as well as doing all the things that you've all been talking about. And of course the big problem in Australia and many places is trying to get funding um, and support for funding because Paramedic research is new. There aren't funding pools out there just waiting for someone to come along and tap on the door. And when we do put up proposals, we get knocked back because you don't have enough track record. We don't know what you're talking about. We don't see the relevance. You know, this is our world, isn't it? You know, because it's just the ambulance. And that's not the way it should be. But so we've got some really interesting plans and hopefully we can pull them off. And these are the 12 programs. And you can see that most of the places have about three people, three towns. And um, some have got four. And I, th I think that's all. Yeah, there are three and four towns in each group. So there's about 30 odd little communities. And most of these communities would be similar size, around about 500 to 1500 people. Some of them have already got some sort of service, first responders or volunteers, and a few haven't got it. They haven't got anything. Like Lockington, which is uh, second from the top I've been to Lockington and Dingy because that's just down the road. They have no services at all in terms of paramedics, and they don't have doctors. They don't have hospitals. So this is a really big initiative for those towns by bringing, encouraging first responders to become volunteer ambulance officers, and actually having senior paramedic to look after them who works for a, you know, a big organisation with a lot of resources and the beauty is that they can actually draw from not just that community paramedic but the adjoining ones and their clinical support officers who are spread all over the state and that's how it's sort of backed up and they've got a comms centre and so forth. And the, the original projects are at the bottom which is Omeo and Mal Malacuta which I worked on 15 years ago. So. Be patient if you've got a barrier. It will eventually come round. Just hope it happens before you either retire or die. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Actually, a road in Bendigo is called Pegleg Road, 
yeah. it's, it's pretty good. Can't beat it. And, and I grew up in a place called Telegarupna. <laughs> easy, easy for you to say. <laughs> um, I'm interested in the, the, the what is the community demand for paramedics to come and look after their health need. I, I suspect the history would suggest that there used to be family GPs resident in a lot of these communities that they have died out or moved away, mm. leaving them with nothing, and therefore the only thing they seem to be on offer at the moment is a paramedic. Will they be welcomed with open arms or is it going to be an uphill battle to get them accepted? I think you're right. What There's been a lot of work done in Australia how much, how many patients you need to make a GP practice viable. And uh, it's a lot more than a thousand. And there are GPs in some of these little towns, but as you say, as the GPs get older, they go away. And um, you can't get new GPs. And even if you can, they don't want to do after hours work. They don't want to work on weekends. We've got a bigger town just down the road that I've been talking to where they have a hospital, a town of about 8,000 people, and the GPs, two practices, have said, we don't want to do on call anymore. Can paramedics do it? So we're looking at the Nova Scotia model of the um, collaborative uh, emergency centres as a solution for that. Um, but yeah, as they leave, they're not replaced. So some of these towns haven't had a GP for a long time. Or uh, well, they might get a visiting GP for a couple of days a week. They might get a, a part-time nurse. Um, so you need something. And the ambulance service in a place like Victoria has got incredible infrastructure, uh, like all the ambulance services in Australia, where, you know, like here, you've got radio systems and data systems and vehicles everywhere and GPS and you can actually offer a lot more than a traditional ambulance service. I've accelerated the program, have I? You've done well. Yeah, it would have gone a lot longer if Sue was here because she could tell you a lot more detail. Thank you, Peter. All right, our next presenter is Matt Leonard, and he's going to talk about contrasting community paramedicine program aspects in Canadian settings. <clears throat> well, we're uh, we're getting there, right? <laughs> uh, 